Good afternoon, y'all. We'll wait a couple minutes while, or a couple seconds while people are logging into the live session here for Talent War Group. While we're waiting for more people to join, I want to thank everyone who is already on the line. Um, for those of you who this is your first time, Talent War Group is an organization of experts who share lessons learned, insight on talent management, leadership, and other organizational development. Uh, we do rely on your growing support, and we wouldn't be here without those of you who are following us and supporting us. If you like what you hear, please share it with your connections and contacts. I also do want to point out that this is a discussion. So although Nayara, Tom, Mike, and I are on your screen, we also want to hear from you. So please type in whether you're on Facebook, LinkedIn, or any other platform, please put in your comments and we will try to get to them whenever we can. So I'd like to kick this off by introducing everyone who's on our panel today. Um, I'd like to start off with Tom Hall. Tom is a former member of the 75th Ranger Regiment. He left service to play college football at Iowa State University. That's pretty awesome. And I always use football references because I'm a football mom. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm actually not wearing my football earrings today, but these were made for me by one of my cheerleaders. Uh, he earned a master's degree in international relations and has spent the last six years advertising and consulting startups throughout multiple industries. So we look forward to getting Tom's opinion on today's topic. And then we also have Mike. You go by Mike or Michael? Mike's fine. All right, we, we also have Mike Herzendorf, and he is currently the Vice President of Operations for Helicopter Association International. He's also the former CEO of New Air, and prior to working at New Air, Mike actually spent 29 years in the Army. He was a special operations aviator with over 20 years of command and leadership experience. His last role in the Army was the chief of staff of the 82nd Airborne Division. For those of you without a lot of military background, you can go ahead and Google it, but 82nd is pretty much 90% of the Army movies that are out there. So that's a big deal. Um, I also want to introduce Nayara. She's going to take notes throughout this discussion. Um, unfortunately, she's usually pretty quiet throughout the discussion, but at the end, she sums up the good points we make and uh, or don't make, as the case may be, to give us a summary of learnings from these sessions. Um, for those of us on the panel, it's kind of a win if Nayara actually quotes you at the end. So, with all the introductions and the opening discussion, to the side, I'd like to kind of introduce the topic. So office tribes. This is near and dear to my heart. Um, for those of you who follow me on social media, you'll see I've posted about my tribe or Team Jaster, which is my family, um, or any other team I, involve, I am involved in. So I love the term team or tribe over family. The specific reason is the goal of a family is the people. You, you still love that crazy Uncle Bob who you only see at Christmas and you're not sure if you want to see him next Christmas, but you still love him because he's part of your family and your goal is to keep the family together and to, to be part of that family at holidays and events. A tribe or a team is more than that. People are the most important asset, but the goal isn't the people. The goal is your end state. So in the business world, people are the most important asset, and you cannot deny how important and critical people are for every step and every stage of development, of work, of your workforce, but you're all working towards a similar goal. Uh, recently, I actually just read a book about the Comanche Indians, and it was interesting to hear about how every part of the tribe played a critical role from the children and the work that they did every day to the hunters, to the gatherers, and how each of them had to play their part, no matter how big or small, for the tribe to survive. Again, the goal being survival and not necessarily the people. 
And then it's a, it's a cold world sometimes, just like it is in corporate America. If you have somebody who doesn't pull their weight in their tribe, they also don't get the benefits of the success of the goal. Um, again, looking at this in business, if you have somebody who's not pulling their own weight, they can't just be like Uncle Bob and come at Christmas and, and that be enough. They have to do their due diligence and be part of it. And, and something that I want to discuss to, to trigger your questions or trigger your thoughts is why do, let's, let's talk about Ellie. Let's talk about law enforcement. Law enforcement does not get paid very much. And the risk is, is sometimes life. I mean, uh, or a firefighter. They run into a fire and they don't get paid very much. Their hours are terrible. They often work 24 hour shifts at a time, several days a week. Some of them even do it as volunteers, meaning they don't get paid at all. But yet they still continue to run into that fire. Is the work really that cool or is it that community? Earlier today, earlier today um, the talent war group and EF Overwatch went and put a, a snippet on, on social media where I actually asked that exact question. Why do you continue to sacrifice? What is it about the team that, that brings you back? Why can someone work a high paying job with excellent benefits and really good work hours, nine to five, five days a week, and be miserable every day but then you see soldiers and you have three soldiers on this call today on the panel that will go to combat deployments and see some stuff that is not good. And the work day might go from five the night before till nine the next night, definitely not a nine to five. And still those soldiers come back from deployments or even just regular work days that are also PT at 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, and they're coming home at 6, 7 o'clock at night, and they have some of the best stories. My personal situation actually drove this discussion of tribe in my household, where my husband and I talked about how we are really team jaster, not really a family. And that's, and that's the fact that I was active duty Army, and my husband was active duty Marine Corps, and we just couldn't get co-located. So we both left the military and he got back into the reserve and I started, I started my corporate job at Shell. Again, great pay, great community, wonderful people, but I was definitely missing something. And the very first day that I went to reserve training, which was five years off after getting off active duty, I was so happy. I called my husband and said, I'm home. And the guys I was there with wanted to go rock climbing after work. And the next day we actually went and jumped out of airplanes and it was fun. I didn't get paid very much for it, but I kept coming back. So the goal of this discussion, and I'm about to start handing it off to Tom and Mike to, to get their initial thoughts on office tribes. But the goal of this discussion is how do we get that tribe mentality at work? in corporate America without, without having to jump out of planes and also avoid the pitfalls. And there are some pitfalls from that tribal culture. So Tom, I'm gonna hand it off to you first and hear your initial thoughts. So Lisa, so Lisa uh, great opening. Um, I, I think the, the first thing for me that kind of comes to mind uh, is with forming that tribe, what I got out of the military, what I got out of a football locker room or any of the great companies I've been at is, is really moving towards that common goal. I, I think that's what is so important on that, that tribe, that team in the military is everybody around you is reliant on each other in some way, shape or form, whether it is, you know, uh, completing the mission together or protecting each other. There's a wide range of things. Having that common goal that you're working towards is really what gets that cohesive bond and that, that tribe mentality where everybody's trying to uplift each other and work as a team. Some of the best companies I've been at are, are companies that foster that culture of everybody working towards the collective good of the company or your department or anything else along those lines. Um, that, that's kind of the, the common denominator for me, what I've experienced, as I said, whether it's been the military, a uh, locker room or, or an office setting. So I don't know if, uh, if Mike, if you have anything to add to that? 
No, thanks. Thanks, Tom. I think, you know, both you and Lisa, you know, brought out two really great points. One, you know, the, the team or the tribe. And, you know, there's that old saying on team together, everyone achieves more. And, and that, that has to be the sort of the first step, obviously, a huge basis. Uh, you know, we used to have a, a saying in the, the unit that I was with is you can't judge your worth by the proximity to the target. So, right, the pilots got to fly to the target. Um, but if it wasn't for the mechanics, the people that pumped gas, you know, the people who brought you the ammo, people who fed you, you know, they, that's the ultimate in, in the team sport there. And, and then to your point, Tom, about, uh, you know, the common goal, it, it is that shared purpose, right? You all have to have that same view and consciousness. And so I think, you know, what adds to the team and what adds to that common goal is is leadership and how in the corporate setting do you create that culture of being a team, the cohesiveness? How do you lead people to that common goal? Because a lot of times in business, you know, it, it's, you know, maybe it is just the bottom line, but there's many other steps that you can take to give them that, 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 that purpose, right? And I think one of the things about, you know, as Lisa said, firefighters, military, um, you have a purpose in life. And, and how do you create that purpose uh, in business? And, and it's hard, but I think it starts with people knowing that you care about them and their development. Lisa, back to you. You know, caring about people is, is a really important point, I think, Mike. And I think part of caring about them is, is when you're looking at the development of an individual. You know, we talk a lot about five-year goals and 10-year goals, but when you're looking at creating a, co a cohesive team that's looking towards whatever that end goal might be, you have to bring everybody in. So we have these catchphrases. We use them in the military. They've seeped into corporate America. You talk about mission statements and what's your vision. Uh, in the Army, I took battalion command a couple months ago, and the the big thing is what's your command philosophy and, and what's your vision and what's your mission statement? Like these are the, these are kind of the, they're great buzzwords, but what we forget is when you're looking at a corporate mission or a corporate vision, people have to be included in that. And to build a team environment, those, those goals have to include maybe your workers and not just your talent. So when I when I say that, I'm talking about building the the tribe with everyone. And that's the person who's really, really happy filling the water cooler, filling the refrigerator with with bottled water every day. And that's what they want to do. And they want to do it forever. They don't necessarily want to ascend to be an office manager, but they have to be included in that vision. They have to be part of the tribe. And and the other employees need to understand that that person plays a critical role. You know, workers can be happy and incentivized by pay and benefits, but when you're managing talent, it's more than that. It is that tribe mentality. Um, so I do think, I do think having a a vision, but a vision that is people based, not just financially based, is important, and not just telling people. Hey, people, you're important to us. Showing them more, more than just a barbecue, but it's a bonus structure that is advantageous towards both the individual contribution and the goals. It's creating an environment where people are encouraged to talk and communicate and not sit in their cubicles with their headphones on. Um, one thing that happened at Shell, which I thought was a huge negative, and um, later on, parts of the company realized it is we went from individual offices to cube farms. And the idea was people would be more interactive and teams would get tighter if the teams were in their own cube section. Well, what happens with that wall is you hear everything going on next door. So you put in your headphones and you actually become less and less engaged with the community around you. So that that cube farm actually ended up being detrimental to our small teams because we started segregating ourselves more, even though we were co-located in an office. Tom, did you have some thoughts on this? 
Yeah, Lisa, I, I think those are great points. Um, one thing that I think I want to mention as well, it goes along with this is, you know, the, the first four letters of culture is, is cult. And that is a, a touchy subject at times, but it's a very important one, especially for young companies um, who, who really envision a certain culture. What I've seen in a lot of young startups is they'll read a couple books on Nike or uh, books on Ford or Amazon, these companies that have built this really strong culture over decades. And they'll say, okay, let's copy and paste it. Well, you can't copy and paste a different company's culture. You really have to let that uh, culture organically grow and you have to guide it along the way, but you can't force it. Because if you end up forcing it, what you end up getting at times instead of a tribe is a, a cult, essentially. You get people that are promoting ideas that maybe aren't in line with other teams. There's no synergy. Um, and I think the, the way to really do that is to focus on, cultures within cultures. You know, there's that great book by, by, by General McChrystal, Team of Teams. It's the same concept for building a good culture in a tribe within a company. You, you know, you have your overall company tribe, your overall company culture, but then you're going to have subcultures and subtribes within them that you have to let flourish and grow in their own way. You know, an, an operations team is going to function and be led differently than an engineering team who's gonna function and be led differently than maybe your people and culture HR department. I think you have to take all these different things uh, in consideration when building out this tribe and building out this culture that everybody's different, different departments are different, different roles are different, they all think differently. And you really have to find that cohesive, holistic approach to really let that flourish. So um, I, I'm gonna shoot it back over to Mike because I know he has uh, something to add as well. Hey, thanks, Tom. You, you know, culture. Culture is everything. And, and I think, uh, you know, there should be a little bit of discussion is how do you create, embed culture in organizations? And you mentioned uh, General Crystal and Team of Teams. You know, and uh, in that book, he described a period of time uh, in Iraq. And I was fortunate enough uh, to serve under him at that time. And, you know, this was in the, the height of the surge in Iraq and things weren't going well. And, you know, we said we were going to double down and go all in, you know, and wh why did we do that? Well, we did that because we believed in, in General McChrystal. We believed in him personally. And I think what what often gets overlooked in the business world is that, that the basis of leadership, you know, and, and Lisa talked about having a, a vision. Uh, I think, in today's rapidly changing business world, I, I say I don't have a vision. I have a view, a broad lane of where I think the organization should go. But then you have to get everyone's opinion and everyone's buy-in and create that that shared understanding, that shared consciousness. And and I think even then, people uh, will probably buy into you as a leader before they will buy into your your vision or view. And so, is is both you, uh, Tom and Lisa, have said it all comes down. Uh, to the people within the organization. So, you know, I, I, and I don't care what kind of business it is. If you create something, if you're a service organization, there's going to be many, many, uh, you know, stakeholders within the organization, the customers, you know, the shareholders, but, but also equally important is the employees. And how do you let them know that they are tremendously valued? How do you give them that sense of purpose? And then how do you, um, create that environment where they are, and I'll, and I'll say happy, where they have that sense of purpose and, and they're grateful for the role that they get to play on, on that team. And so I think, uh, you know, culture is everything, as you said, Tom, and a lot of people really don't understand the basis of how you have to uh, inculcate a culture within an organization. And it's all about the actions of the leaders and how that that's, you know, transpired down throughout the, the team or the tribe. You know, um, all good points. And I, I think the biggest question that I have as a leader and a manager is how do you help seed the development of tribes and at what level are they appropriate? So we talked about big organizations like Nike, Tom referenced Nike. Um, and again, I referenced Shell Oil Company, but I never thought of myself as a Shell employee. That's what my resume said. But I worked in unconventional oils and I was on the Permian team or I was on the Eagleford team. And it was a small group of people. And even those who were assigned to the same project, but were a different part or at a different location, 
we still had a a bond if they wore their eagle furred um t-shirt and i saw them at the airport as i was going uh to the project site and they were coming back it was you know the the mental high five as you walked by them and there was a tribal mentality but how I've seen it develop. Is there a way that we as leaders or even as part of the organization can help grow and, and seed that that team, that tribal development? Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts, Tom? Yeah, so I think there's one key part part that you you mentioned earlier, Lisa, that is very important that a lot of companies gloss over, and that is calling themselves a family. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, <laughs> I've seen companies that want to refer to everybody as being a family. That's that's a great intention. I, I can't argue against that. But ultimately, though, as a family, my family is not going to get a new shareholder or investor that can force the company to lay off 30, 40 percent of the people. My my family is, you know, not going to potentially fold with bankruptcy and have to lay everybody off. I mean, that's, that's the reality we live in, especially in 2020 during a pandemic is, you know, you're, you're, you're tied together with your family forever. Whereas a company, you know, you can form that family bond outside of the office. That's, that's very feasible, very practical, very common. But when you're in the office, I think looking at it as a tribe instead of a family is vital and important because yeah, you know, in the military, you're working alongside people. If they screw up, if they're not good at their jobs, they can get removed. They can get replaced. You're not going to have that in a family. You know, if your uncle Bob shows up and stirs up political conversations at Thanksgiving or Christmas, you still kind of got to like the guy and you got to deal with him. Whereas in the civilian world with a company, the way that works, um, if someone's disruptive or causing problems or not gelling well, they might get removed or they might get moved somewhere else. So I think when we're discussing this tribal stuff, I think really mentioning that reinforcing that it's not a family and here's, and that's not a bad thing. Here's why I, I think is, is important. And I think a lot of people tend to gloss over that, uh, especially in 2020. I'll send it over to Mike. Hey, hey, thanks, Tom. I want to, you know, address, address one point that Lisa made and, and then address one that you made. You know, I, I, I found that interesting, Lisa, how you talked about um, you were a shell employee, but you, associated yourself with another smaller part of that organization. And I, I think that's important because I think there, there could be some downsides to that too. Whereas then these teams or tribes within the larger organization get to maybe think that they know more what's going on or what they're doing is more important. And so, you know, uh, I've even seen that in the military, you know, you have these small little organizations, you know, let's say platoons or companies you know, within a battalion or a brigade. And sometimes they will focus so much on themselves and they'll become very insular. Now they're very tight and they're very cohesive and there's goodness in that. But if they don't then see the larger picture of the greater organization that they serve, I think I think that could be um, a problematic. And, and I've seen that happen in, in the business world as well. So I, I don't know if, uh, if Lisa, you or Tom have thoughts on that. You know, I was actually thinking about the, I guess, the negatives of some of the tribal behaviors. And, um, you know, in the Army, you've got your Alpha and Bravo companies. Unfortunately, now in the reserves, the engineers, it's 808th and 321st. And the numbers are different. But back when I first joined the Army, you had a battalion, you had Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie companies, and then you had your maintenance. Um, but there was always something between A team and the Bulldogs. And there was, and it was great competition because there was a leaderboard. We were fighting for school slots, air assault school, airborne school. We were we were raising the bar for the other company or platoon, depending on on where where we were through competition. But then there also is definitely a negative aspect to that tribal mentality, which is, well, am I going to help my buddy out or are we going to so internalize our tribal behavior that we've now now made a culture that isn't conducive to the larger organization? So is there a lack of sharing now that we've we've dug into this? Is there is there literally an are you ostracizing yourself because you've become so so cultic or have you become so loyal to your teammates? that you lose lose sight on, you know, not as dramatic as morals, but 
something other, um, you lose sight of the end game. It, it's all about the numbers and it's not, everybody's now working 12 hour days because they're trying to, to fight and, and be the best sales team or be the best producers. Um, there are a lot of negatives that come, can come from tribes and Mike, I'd like to hear your points. Yeah, no, Lisa, I, I think those were, were phenomenal examples that we've all seen, you know, the competition's good up to a point, um, but we always have to keep the, the broader uh, or organization's goals in mind. And, you know, what Tom talked about was how you have uh, individuals who maybe in the corporate world, and I've seen it, you know, were not, uh, you know, potentially doing their job as, as well as they could. In the military, a lot of times, the military had great structure for counseling. And, and I've not seen, uh, at least in you know my few years in the in the corporate world, as good um, performance counseling systems that that I'd seen before. And so a lot of those things, <clears throat> you know, I, I've tried to institute because I think when you sit someone down, you have that one-on-one -on -one personal conversation, and that they see that you are invested uh, in their development, and you know. They want to be appreciated. They want to be recognized. They want to be encouraged. And you have those candid conversations about here's what I expect you to do. And if they don't achieve that level, you know, you have to ask yourself, OK, why did they not? Was I not clear in what I wanted them to do? Were they not trained? Did they not have the resources um, or was it, you know, an attitude? And so obviously uh, adjusting attitudes is probably the hardest thing. Um, but you have to look at all those reasons in, in some, you know, performance counseling kind of system, because I think that's really one of those basic steps into then, you know, getting everyone to achieve their, their highest level. And then they get to see that, hey, you know, Lisa, Tom and Mike care about me. We've sat down. We've had a conversation. And, and you, you know, you do that every so often. And, and I think those are some great tools in the military that are underutilized in uh, the corporate world. And especially if you have a bonus kind of structure, you know, I've seen companies where it's just naturally every, you know, the end of every year, everyone gets a 2%, 3%, you know, bonus and raise and people become to expect it. Well, then you get a new CEO or a new leader and they, you know, put a different lens or metric on that. It really gets frustrating. And so I think a lot of what Tom talked about, um, at least from what I've seen, comes down to just basic, you know, one-on-one -on -one performance counseling, getting to know someone and being clear in, in the expectations that, that you have for them and, and that what they also have for you. And what, what do you do to break down those roadblocks for them to be successful? Mike, I absolutely love um, that you brought up counseling as a way to build that community, because I think I think in corporate America, we fail to have some of those open communications that you have to have in the military. Uh, in, in my specific case, when, and, and I know y'all as well, but when you're tenting with someone or on some of our movements north during Operation Iraqi Freedom, I, I didn't have an opportunity to set up a hooch and be separated from my guys. We were sleeping on our trucks and we were there and you talk about everything. And in corporate America, you spend sometimes 40 to 60, depending on the, the intensity of the work at the time with these people and conversations aren't always as free flowing because you're not together during those those vulnerable times. And, and counseling is a great way to open the door for discussions. Um, and I, I think we could probably talk about that just in and of itself. Uh, some of the lessons learned from the military and how they could be brought into our, our civilian careers for another half hour. Um, but to stay on this topic, I, I wanted to find out, uh, Tom and then Mike, if you had any other points you wanted to make before we move on. Yeah, I can go ahead. Uh, one more thing that popped in mind is, uh, you know, when we're talking about tribes, the key element of these tribes uh, at any level is the leadership. Uh, that tribe falls apart, that, that tribe might not have meaning or purpose if they have a bad leader instilled in them. And I think, uh, you know, one thing with being a leader, especially in a diverse uh, work environment, is really understanding how to lead people, how to motivate people within those tribes. I already mentioned that 
you know, the, the tribe of engineering might be different than the tribe of operations or accounting or HR. Um, but, but being a leader and being able to assess those team members within that tribe, motivate them. That's really for me, for example, in, in Ranger Battalion, I was surrounded by guys who in my personal civilian life, I probably never would have socialized with had I not been forced to socialize and work alongside them. And we were lucky and fortunate enough to have leaders that really knew how to motivate and lead, not necessarily just as a team or a tribe, but individually to every single person. You know, the way you lead that that introverted guy from West Virginia is going to be different than the way you're leading maybe that extroverted New Yorker who is completely different socially. I think those are key aspects that tend to get glossed over is you can have a great team that's very cohesive, but if you don't put the proper leader in charge of them that knows how to individually assess each team and each person, how to lead them as a group, um, it's going to fail. So I think that's uh, that's one key point that I wanted to add at the end there. Um, uh, Mike, do you have anything else? Well, I'm curious as to why you picked out aggressive New Yorkers, but I think I'll let that. I'm one from the go Midwest, Mike. I, I don't. I just. I didn't want to go to the Midwest because we're just quiet, nice people here, supposedly. So. Well, yeah. So, so am I. I'm, I'm a kinder, gentler uh, Mike Kurtzendorf. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I mean, it really. At the end of the day, right? We're talking. You know, the talent war group. What does it all come down to? It comes down to talent. Talent's about leadership, and so I think you hit all the points. You know exactly right. It's going to be different for every person, and and how do you motivate them? And, and I would tell you, um, you know, you, when I was in the military, I thought, oh, corporate corporate world was easy. Uh, now that I'm in the corporate world, I'm like, man, the military had it really easy. You know, in the military, you, the motivation, the missions are often very much clear with a greater sense of purpose. And in the corporate world, they're not the same. And now with a lot of companies working remote, you know, when you're, you're a Zoom warrior for six to eight hours a day, how do you have those personal connections with people to motivate them to do that counseling because it is such a challenging environment. And so I think, you know, what we're going to start to see is uh, all different, you know, forms of leadership are going to develop in, in a remote space. And I've gone to the, the point where I just pick up the phone once a week and or even FaceTime just one on one. And we just talk about anything other than work. And you just get to know that person uh, at a different level. And I think that's, you, you know, how you really do build that team. It is one person at a time, like you said, Tom, and it's, it's different for every person. So Mike's comments actually kind of wrapped up the last question I had was, how do you build those teams at the, the lowest level? And that's really, if you want to have that environment where you enjoy coming to work and you want to be part of a tribe and those 40 plus hours a week is, is time well spent, then actively build the tribe, which means reach out and and be curious about somebody as a person. I had an employee working for me at one point in time and our boss, so his boss's boss, he said, I can't connect with her. I have no idea what this person wants from me. And it was causing a lot of anxiety and work was not a fun place for him to be because he wasn't sure how to connect with his boss's boss. And with that, he just couldn't um, he couldn't move forward with talking about business because he couldn't connect on a personal level. And I said, what's her screensaver? And she had, she had a Dodge charger, not her kids, not her husband, not her puppy, not her dream house, nothing else. Her screensaver on her computer was a Dodge charger. And I said, do you know anything about cars? He said, no. I said, get a muscle magazine, read it cover to cover and ask her about cars. I promise you won't have to say anything else. And it literally was that simple. He asked her about, hey, why do you have a Dodge Charger as your screensaver? And next thing you know, they went to lunch, they built a relationship and the work environment became a lot simpler and, and easier. Um, now we're coming to uh, my favorite part of, of this discussion. And, and that's actually to go to Nayara and as the um, digital marketing associate at EF Overwatch and, and someone who's listening in, I'd like to hear the points that you took from this discussion. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you everyone for having me here today. Uh, this discussion was very insightful and I believe that anyone who's interested in really digging deep into how to improve 
an organization's vision, your own vision, you should rewatch and take some notes because there were so many great points. And the first main point that I gathered was from Lisa, where she mentioned right at the beginning how a book she read about survival and tribes made her think about the quote, people are your most important asset. Uh, on the book, uh, the people in that tribe were responsible for their own survival and without each other, they wouldn't be able to, uh, to survive. So the people that are around you can really impact you on our an individual level, on a personal level, but also everyone impacts each other. The group really matters. And so this is why people who experience their uh, a military experience or a civilian job that they really love, uh, those people tend to obviously remain years and years on that same job. And it's because all of them have really created their own tribe within that organization uh, where every single person belongs and has their purpose within. So it makes you think, why is there that so many people who have such a great job with such great benefits sometimes really dislike their day to day so much? And it's the answer to that to that is the lack of a tribe culture. So how do we get the same cult in other organizations? How do we improve that to make the employees feel a, a part of a team and a sense of belonging? So I gathered three points. Um, one of the points is obviously good leadership, uh, then good communication and counseling since information will make your team thrive always because everyone will be on the same page. And then lastly, loyalty, uh, because loyalty is always a two-way streak so as an employee, you should always be loyal to your company and try and put as much effort as you can. And at the same time, your employer should give you the maximum amount of resources so you can perform at your best. So my second point uh, was from Mike when he said that leadership is intrin intrinsic to mark the purpose of the company. It is necessary for the entire organization to understand and most importantly, to apply the company's values and goals. Mike said, uh, culture is everything. So how to embed culture in those organizations? Well, you need to create a vision for everyone, or as Mike said, a view. And again, this view needs to be presented to the entire team, communicated to the entire team. So each member of the tribe can have their own take on it and then improve from there. And then building your team is by spending time with your tribe, as Mike said, it is good to know everyone on a personal level. That makes the organization and overall to feel more comfortable with each other and to just have a better time during the day, a great time during work. And then lastly, uh, as Tom, uh, Tom quoted, everybody around you is related in some shape or form. So companies that foster that collective good will increase the chances of, be, of everyone in the company to succeed and to perform with a high standard because the company never succeeds with just one person. Everyone should matter because everyone should be helping each other out. Um, as one of uh, my bosses says, George Randall, uh, the company is an ecosystem. So everyone needs to be in their own position and thrive and everyone needs to help each other out so that ecosystem can thrive and grow. So funny enough, Nayara, I'm writing down that whole company ecosystem. So I've got quote, I also have quotes from all of the panelists to include you now on my note page. Um, I really appreciate everyone joining. I do, if you're listening, if you're watching, um, we have another panel led by the behavioral scientist, Dr. Chris Free, called Kissing the Demon, Reaching Peak Performance. He's definitely better at coming up with titles than I am. Um, I'm interested just because kissing the demon sounds like something that should be pretty dynamic. Um, and that is Thursday, the 17th at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. Really appreciate everybody who dialed in. Uh, if you like what you heard, of course, share. Also, remember that all of these panel members, as well as anyone else in the Talent War Group, is available for consultation and speaking. Um, Thank you very much and have a wonderful day and Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or Happy Hanukkah as the quote may be. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.